talked about that default mode network. The brain is the body's most complex organ. Some of the most addictive medications we have are benzodiazepines, anti-anxiety meds. Because when, when neurons fire together electrically, they create chemistry. It's not the other way around. Let's just start with anxiety. What's, okay. what's going on there? Anxiety. <clears throat> well, there are, we talked about that default mode network earlier. And the default mode network is regions of the brain that operate together. And it's like where you step back and you have this hope for your future and uh, a sense of self and kind of being able to pause and relax and step back. So first thing we think about with anxiety is what do the brain waves look like? Are there brain waves too much in the high beta? And if they're too much in the high beta, then that's gonna be, they're not gonna be able to relax. So let's say that's part of sometimes people with anxiety. It's very common, very common. Way too much high beta, whether it's in the frontal lobe like we talked about, whether it's in the emotional cortex of the brain, which is the limbic area, which is right here. Way too much high beta in this area. Or, that default mode network is disrupted, and so that's not letting their brain relax. I'm trying to get that back together. So there's not an area that we, like, we can say memory is primarily in that temporal lobe, but we can't say, oh, anxiety is just there. Because different people present differently. Some people it's emanating from the frontal lobe. Some people it's emanating in the cingulate, that limbic area inside. Some people, it's emanating because this thing back here, the cerebellum in the back of my brain, which is for coordination of things, is not firing properly to the front. So that's how complex it is, right? I mean, it's said the brain is the body's most complex organ. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain level I wanna try to help things become like, oh, I get what he's saying, but some of it is complicated. <laughs> It's not just so easy to say, oh, and that's what, unfortunately, I think we've done a lot in healthcare. Oh, you have anxiety, here you go. And it's a chemistry approach. So, I mean, modern psychiatry, a lot of them, Dr. Daniel Amen for one, and many others are saying, we're behind because we're treating everything like it's a chemistry issue because that was the thought, that it's always a chemical imbalance. Okay. But now we realize, oh, maybe it's not necessarily a chemical imbalance, maybe it's an imbalance in the firing of that brain. Because when, when neurons fire together electrically, they create chemistry. It's not the other way around. It's not like all of a sudden chemistry just starts being produced. It's like the brain's firing or not firing, and it's producing chemistry or not producing chemistry. Our approach in the past, meaning healthcare, has been let's use a chemical approach. And why? Why have we used that? I don't know. Is it because of, you know, you c it's ways to research and funding? I mean, probably, right? We know big pharma. It's money. There's a lot of money involved. There's people trying to help. There's scientists. There's academics. But there's money, big money involved. So who's to say? But anxiety can be different areas of the brain that have very high brain waves that are overactive and from a brain standpoint, and then we wanna look at how do we get inhibition? How do we get the brain to start shutting that down? Is it talk therapy, which can help bring out some of the issues maybe that drove the anxiety, separation anxiety for people? Dr. Russell Kennedy says that. He says it's a lot of, it's an alarm in your body going off usually from separation anxiety. So different, different uh, schools of thought and different domains of science have different reasons as to why there's an anxiety. Okay. They, they would say. So a psychologist would explain it one way and a psychiatrist perhaps a little bit differently. Uh, someone who does mind-body medicine might explain it a little differently. But what I'm saying is, okay, we have oftentimes high beta in certain areas of the brain and the goal is whatever therapy, how can we bring that under control. And I think it's usually a multi-disciplined approach works best. Because what's the alternative versus, take this, some of the most uh, addictive medications we have are benzodiazepines, anti-anxiety meds. I mean, and there's people that say, we really don't want you to take these. But when someone's in a panic state, 
Okay, we get it. We know there's a need and it's helpful and we're thankful, but can it be misused and abused? Of course it can. So we wanna dial it back, figure out what's going on in their brain and see what other kind of solutions. And we have, we have children under 12 with severe anxiety. Can you imagine? Severe, cannot function. I mean, this just That's this horrible. breaks my heart. Yeah, I mean, little children, teenagers. That's what I was mentioning last night. The one thing that gets me more than anything is the young people, and they're because of some of these mood disorders like anxiety, just wrecking them. And then what's the cause? Many things, many things. The outward environment, the inward environment, the brain environment. You know, all these contributing factors. It's it's a it's a big it's a big task to try to help people recover. Does, does that kind of help with anxiety? It does. Is, is there anything that people can do naturally to lower anxiety? Yeah, so, I mean, the brain creates uh, many neurotransmitters, uh, neuromodulatory transmitters. The brain creates a lot of chemistry for itself. Serotonin, dopamine, I mentioned those earlier, acetylcholine, that's really involved with memory. But GABA, G-A-B-A, which stands for a certain longer name, people can Google that, GABA is one that your brain makes. And GABA is the only one that's the inhibitory, calms you down. So people have used GABA, you, which you can buy over the counter, it's just a very simple supplement, and you get some, because it has to go through your gut and be broken down and then through the liver and then be absorbed and then be converted, so it's quite a process. But some people find that GABA, using GABA is very helpful for things like anxiety, for things like sleep disruption, and muscle stiffness. Why? Because GABAergic drugs are used for sleep, anxiety, and muscle stiffness. So GABA can be something as a simple trial that someone could use. It's safe, it's non-toxic, it's, you know, it's water soluble, so you're not gonna store up all this. And you might see that, you might notice a change with that. And you have to, I usually dose it up with my clients to see if they're getting a change. I don't, I, it's not one of those things you need to try for six months. Okay. You're going to know in a week or it's not for you. That was gonna, what I was going to ask. How long does yeah. it need to be in your system before you start to you see start, And I dose people up. We might start at, uh, for example, and this is not medical advice for people. I might start with 200 milligrams and go to 400 and you don't notice anything. And then 600 and then 800. Because most of the times you see it in the store, it's 750 milligrams to, to 1,000. So, you know, you can start on a lower dose and try it and notice. And when would you take it? If you're having trouble sleeping, you take it in the evening. If you're having anxiety through the day and that's really your suffering point, maybe you're starting it in, earlier in your day. So it's, it's a simple, non-toxic, relatively safe trial, short-term, seeing does it help me or not? And if it doesn't, that's not the thing for them. The other thing a lot of people use, and we use it very successfully, is CBD. That helps a lot of people with anxiety. Not everybody, but a lot of people. Okay. And then there's something that I'm, I have no disclosure. I don't sell them. There's something, two little wrists, they look like wristwatches, and they're called touch points, touch points. Are these the things, the metal bands with the little balls on the end? No, they're, from acupuncture, there's some things I think like that. Okay. These vibrate back and forth, bzz, 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 back and forth, and you just turn them on, click them on. And you can put them here, and they, or you can put them on your ankles. You can clip it on, and it, it's been very effective in helping people with anxiety. Why? Because it operates through a sensory mechanism into the brain, and it's gonna lower the threshold of that high beta. I was gonna bring them, but I brought other tech just to see, because why? It's a low cost device that's very helpful for, I mean, just so many people, and you can buy it off the internet. So, and we use that with a lot of the kids. We also use it with adults, but when you have a kid that's on these medications that are very addictive, and the parents would rather have an option, and so we try that, and they're like, wow, those things are the greatest thing. Now they can, and we use the same kind of device many times for people who have attention problems, because attention problems can have too much of a certain brainwave. And if we can kind of disrupt that elevated brainwave or alter it, we may get them to be able to keep their attention longer. And then if you can keep your attention longer or you can lower your anxiety, now you can train your brain at that level and strengthen it. What are these things called? Touch points. I'm getting some. You should, I definitely recommend it. They're not expensive at all and they're worth a try. Okay. You know, they're I'm worth a try. I'm definitely gonna try those. Let's move into ADHD. Yep. So I grew up 
I got diagnosed with that, I think, believe in fourth grade. Couldn't stand it. Hated taking the meds. Um, used to throw them out the window on the way to school because I didn't want to be different than anybody else. And now it's 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 becoming, at least it appears to me, that it's becoming so common. I think that more people say they have ADD, ADHD than don't have it now. And, and, and why is that? Why is everybody, why can't anybody hold a thought anymore? Yeah. Why? <laughs> why? I think there's probably a lot of reasons. We're talking about a younger generation or talk about the, you know, the more current, the twenties to thirties. Sure. Or eighteens to thirties. Uh, part of it, I, what I have gathered in reading some books, there's a great book called Dopamine Nation written by a psychiatrist out of Stanford. Again, I keep referring to Stanford. I didn't go there. I'm not part of their <laughs> donation fund or whatever they have. But <laughs> there's some excellent researchers there. So I, you know, I, I, I like to understand things from their side who are working in the lab. I'm working with people. They're working in labs. So I get to see that data and say, can we use that? And that's what we, what we call clinical neuroscience. We're taking neuroscience out of there and putting, using it in the clinic right now. Because it could take 20 years before that data is now being used in a therapy. We're trying to extract it safely, non-invasive therapies, and say, let's try it right now. Not, it's not trying dangerous things, they're safe things, but we're applying the principles of what they're doing there in the center. You personally are doing that, or yeah. neurology? Functional neurologists. Function, functional neurologists across the country are doing this, or just your? No, they're across the country, across the, the world. Okay. We have a network all over the world that have been trained and, and utilize a lot of these principles. So going back to that, Dopamine Nation, it's a very interesting book. Adderall, in one of the first stories, a guy talks about like, this helped me perform. And that's, I think, one of the things is, help me perform. Mm -hmm. How can I perform better either in a social situation, in a work situation, whatever it is, how can I perform better, right? We all wanna perform better. But these things have become so accessible, this is my opinion now, these medications, drugs have become so accessible that everyone goes to them, all the young people, a lot of young people. So much so, perhaps you know this, that that's one of the things that they buy from each other. They mm -hmm. have a prescription, I'm gonna sell my Adderall prescription to somebody or my Benzo prescription. So that's, that's where we are. Well, it's interesting, I mean, truth be told, I'm one of them. You know, I did that. I didn't, I, I sporadically took Adderall and Ritalin growing up. Then I joined the military, didn't take it at all. Every once in a while for an operation, they would give us some provisual or some Adderall or something if it was going to be a long night or a couple of days. But I didn't start taking it on a regular basis again until I started business. And it did help. It did help with functionality and it helped me be more productive. It also dramatically increased my irritability and anxiety. Yeah. And so I quit taking them and, and uh, I, I would take it sporadically. Then I did the psychedelic thing and I didn't, I haven't taken them again since it's been almost a year now, but, but um, that's, that's kind of, I'm just telling you this. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It's a reality. It's, that's kind of where we are. So we need to have other options or it would be nice to have other options. Again, going back to what's going on in their brain. So here it's, it's so, what's so fascinating. What you told me is that when I was in fourth grade, I had diagnosed with this, then I became an operator and then I was, had concussions and you see how one thing layers on top of other things. So we know that someone who has ADHD, we know this in the literature, or a woman at a certain point in her cycle or menstrual cycle, or someone with anxiety that has a concussion will have a less better outcome than someone who didn't have that. Because it's more complicating. The brain has already been dealing with something. Okay. Right? It's like what you brought to the party. I didn't bring a, a normal, typical brain. I brought a brain that was dealing with ADHD, which may have been too much activity of high beta or too much theta activity. So, that's why we have to understand brain mapping and do these cognoscopies every year. Doing the least expensive, least invasive approaches to understanding the brain every year. Like the old physicals that people used to do back in the day. I do a yearly physical. What about a brain evaluation every year? That's low tech, or not low tech, high tech, but non-invasive, low cost. 
and someone to interpret it. Then you know where you are. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.